Support Wrestle Talk. Ronda Rousey is the new SmackDown Women's Champion. Edge vs Finn Balor turns into Mummy War. And most importantly, the copyright logo misdirect from NXT TakeOvers was called up to the main roster. Which was for the WWE return of Bray Wyatt. Which I guess was a pretty big deal. I'm Ollie Davis and this is my review of WWE Extreme Rules 2022 in about 10 minutes. Before I get into that though, give us a subscribe and enable notifications to always on for all the latest backstage news and wrestling reviews, aka... <laughs> that would be really nice, thank you, great, you won't regret it. After an opening video package that felt like Paul Heyman had kidnapped a child and forced them to spell the word extreme, and the teasing graphic of a video game white rabbit hopping down a hole, this premium live event opened on my most anticipated match of the night, Imperium, versus the Brawling Brutes. This is one of those feuds that would have been absolutely terrible under Vince McMahon, laden with lazy stereotyping, lame comedy, and built around I'm Irish and I wear a little hat, versus I'm a vague assortment of German and Austrian and we like rules. But in Triple H's hands, this feud has been booked how it was supposed to be, around Gunther and Sheamus chopping the sh out of each other. Apart from the occasional shillelagh, occasional shillelagh, title of your indie wrestling pay-per-view, the Donny Brook stipulation was most Mostly just barrels and bar set dressing. These guys really didn't need weapons because they have Gunther's massive hands. Just like their Clash at the Castle singles encounter, which really brought this feud to life, the crowd were incredibly into the stiff slapping action. And avenging losing his second Intercontinental title shot from SmackDown, Sheamus put Gunther through the commentary table and then won with a bro kick on Vinci. These two teams could feud forever, and I'm not sure I would ever get bored. Don't think I could say the same for Liv Morgan and Ronda Rousey. And I'm hoping both can move on from each other now after their several month feud. Liv has unfortunately been one of the few acts that feels worse off in the new regime. She's struggled to ever pose a credible threat to Rousey despite being the champion. And that weakness continued here. They worked hard, but a lot of the story was based around no selling baseball bat shots. Sting would be furious and Liv needing a weapon while Ronda was just content to use her fighting skills. That's a tough dynamic for the babyface to be in. Neither badass or competent. WWE pay-per-view finishes have improved significantly as of late though, and there was enough intrigue to hopefully set up better directions for them moving forward, even though I still had no idea what hold Rousey had her in. Liv hit a senton through the table, but Ronda kicked out into what Corey Graves said was a bicep crusher, a bicep crusher so hard it made Morgan pass out, with what looked like a smile on her face. Perhaps this signals the start of a character reset for Morgan, the extreme stipulation unlocking something more unhinged within her. More like the Harley Quinn style character she had in her Riot Squad days. Karrion Cross wouldn't put the strap on for his match against Drew McIntyre. Giggity. Drew forced his fist through the hole though, and the match got underway. Built to Drew's kip up comeback template, had a really intense whipping exchange, but then Scarlet stopped Drew's Claymore with pepper spray. A far more dependable attack than Pyromancy, which, as I know from Full Metal Alchemist, can take decades to perfect. Cross winning was the right result, otherwise he'd be dead in the water. But this wasn't the blowaway match to cement him as one of SmackDown's top heels either. After we were shown Nikita Lyons in the crowd, shots of soon-to-be debuting wrestlers in the crowd to the main roster confirmed. We got Bayley versus Bianca Belair in WWE's first ever ladder match for a women's singles title. Belair's offensive style is tailor-made to introduce ladders into, with her combination of incredible athleticism and strength, while Bayley played the perfect foil, her heel persona cutting off Bianca's high spots. Damage Control got involved at the point Bianca was first going to win, because of course they did. How would Belair get out of this? Actually, it's going to be super easy, barely an inconvenience. Sky and Kai proved utterly ineffectual, with Belair, someone who just wrestled for 12 or so minutes with brutal ladder spots, immediately beating them both up and delivering a double KOD. I wouldn't have minded that if it then led to a Bailey victory, but that didn't happen either, with Belair hitting a very impressive KOD onto her, onto a ladder, and then climbing up to win. This was a very decent match, but one of the few on this card that leaves me indifferent to where these characters go next. Belair is still the invincible, increasingly one-dimensional champion, and damage can can no longer be taken as a serious threat. But then came my match of the night. The 30 minute soap opera, actually the same length as an episode of EastEnders, of Finn Balor 
versus Edge. The first half was actually a bit naff. It was annoyingly one of those I quit matches where the referee holds the microphone up for every spot, even right from the start of the match, in the first submission spot about a minute in. Those should be saved when the match really might end. It's like starting immediately on near falls. It also meant that the intensity of the wrestling was constantly peppered with Bala and Edge grunting and heavy breathing and going, no, I'm Never! No! No! How about no? But then, thankfully, came all of the tea. I don't know if I used the slang word T here correctly. Bala started to say I quit, which brought out Damien and Dom for the save, and Edge speared them all off the apron. Amazing! But then Rhea handcuffed Edge to the top rope. Oh, she knows exactly what she's doing, simps. And Edge looked down the hard cam, accepting the beatdown fate. Tragedy! But Rey Mysterio then ran down for the save, but Dom took him out to great heat. Oedipal fight! Then Beth Phoenix took Dom out and squared off against Rhea Ripley. Mummy fight! Then Edge, now on top again, kicked Dom in the balls as his clash at the castle receipt hit three spears on Finn, but Rhea brass knuckle punched Phoenix out. Maybe Edge isn't winning! Finn hit three coup de gras to even out the finishers and forced Edge to say I quit by threatening a concerto on his unconscious wife. I was so into this match, I was sitting all alone in my living room yelling, do it anyway, Rhea, do it for the heat, and then shrieking yes when Ripley hit Beth in the head. This was an incredible match of twists and turns. It felt like Shane versus Vince at WrestleMania 17, just with better wrestling instead of hardcore spots. I loved, 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 Loved it. Concluding a night-long backstage storyline, Dexter Loomis choked out Miz again and walked off with the Philly Fanatic for a hometown pop. And the main event, although, you know, not really the main event, was Seth Rollins versus Matt Riddle in a fight pit match. But first, a wild brawn breaker in the crowd. They had a decent 15 minute match using the stipulation of ropes and turnbuckles, just being metal cage now. There was a lot of running up the wall to hit diving moves, mixed with map based submissions. Because Riddle is a map based Pokemon. His name is Matt. The literal high spot was when they chased each other to the top platform, with Seth hitting a pedigree and a very scary buckle bomb, but Riddle firing back with an RKO and then a senton off the top. The finish was again very good, with Riddle locking in the triangle and not letting go despite several Seth power bombs. He tapped, giving Riddle a much needed win in his MMA style environment. Special guest referee Daniel Cormier, who really didn't get involved at all, raised Riddle's hand on the entrance ramp. I was so happy with the Edge Balor match and this show yet again over delivering I kind of forgot about why we were all really here. So when the copyright logo appeared, other NXT takeover trick to the main roster confirmed, and the lights cut out, I popped all the harder because it's rabbit hole time! The arena plunged into darkness. The crowd held up the torches on their phones and the speakers started playing. He's got the whole world in his hands. We saw hideous full-size cosplay versions of Huskus, Mercy, Rambling Rabbit, Sister Abigail, a burnt fiend mask on the commentary table, the fiend itself in the crowd. Michael Cole and Corey Graves were fantastic, effectively getting over their confusion of whether this was or wasn't part of the broadcast. A short film ran showing the Firefly Funhouse in ruins. All the puppets had died. And the TV set flickered on to show a new face, something even deeper in Bray's subconscious to ask who killed the world. We had all figured it out. We all knew it was Bray. They could have left it there, but just like a wrestling match with Hope Spot building Hope Spot, they just kept the anticipation rising and rising and rising. A door appeared on the stage. I'm freaking tingling right now. It kicks open. There's a light. The light shuts off. A torch appears. Oh my God. And a man walks out wearing the mask from the TV set. Yes! Who takes it off to reveal and finally confirm a returning Bray Wyatt to huge holy S-word charts. That's Philadelphia and ECW for you, naughty, naughty language. This was one of the best wrestling returns I've ever seen. Somehow coming just a year after, the other best wrestling return I've ever seen. But whereas CM Punk was all real, not setting up any angles, just explaining how great it is to be back in pro wrestling, which turned out super well in the end, this was the total 
total opposite side of the spectrum. This was Bray returning for sports entertainment with not a shred of shoot reality in sight, which I'm grateful for. I'm kind of a bit sick of shoot reality right now. This was all twisted, dark, escapist fantasy. I don't care if he's consistently an impossible person to book in feuds. He has once again become the hottest thing in the industry entirely because of his otherworldly creativity. And hopefully, now with Triple H in control, we will finally get to see the full extent of that unleashed. What did you think of Extreme Rules? Let me know in the comments. This is sports entertainment done right. Imperium vs. The Brutes, the soap opera awesomeness of Edge vs. Balor, and an all-time great moment in Bray's return. The weekly TV might be a bit mid, but it's given the premium show's headspace to be the peak events they're designed to be. In the Vince days, all the shows blurred into one. I couldn't tell you what happened on which show looking back. Triple H has given us three clear, definitive angles for his pay-per-view so far. The Brock Lesnar digger at SummerSlam, the Solo Sokoa debut at Clash at the Castle, and now the Bray Wyatt return here. And all that at three hours a show. WWE Extreme Rules 2022 is 95%. Make sure to subscribe because we'll have all the backstage news from the event coming right up. But in the meantime, catch up on our MyGM series here. All right, yeah, you ready? Okay, yep. starting in three, two, one. I haven't got a goddamn clue how to play this game. I don't know why I'm even here. The substitute teacher's here and, oh, the students on Monday Night Smackdown, they're, they're gonna play.